We're going to take a quick break and talk about Drizzly. Drizzly is fantastic. It's the most convenient way to buy beer, wine, and spirits with delivery to your doorstep. And get this, under 60 minutes. It's insane. Yeah, I think what's also great is you can compare prices and shop different places and get your best deal. And you know, you're you're shopping and you're doing a lot of cooking during the holiday season and you're all busy and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I need that bottle of wine. Wrapping presents and you don't want to have to take time to run to the store. Or you forget a gift yeah. and you need it delivered real quickly. Here's the way to do it. You download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y.com. And Drizzly is giving every new customer $5 off their first order. What's that promo code, Seton? Fast5 at checkout. F-A-S-T-5 at checkout. It's drizzly.com. It's not too late to make someone's holiday season a special one. Start now as an Amazon delivery station warehouse associate to earn some extra money for the holidays. You'd help bring joy to thousands near you by preparing packages and loading them up for their final delivery. With night and early morning shifts available through the new year, you'd also have the flexibility to spend time with your loved ones. To start as a delivery station associate, go to Amazon.com slash holiday work. Amazon is a proud equal opportunity employer. Impact of Influence, the tragic story of a powerful South Carolina family and the mysterious deaths that they are linked to. Hi, friends. I am Matt Harris. And with me, of course, as always, my co-host, Seton Tucker. Uh, Seton, good day. Did you pull your stuff together? You're running around getting your kid's birthday. Yes, we finally got everything together. I got her some makeup. She's 14 from Ulta, so she's, she's pretty <laughs> excited to open that this morning. Well, see, this is one of the uh, comments that's been made is about our organizational skills and our issues. And you will be all happy to know that the lack of organizational skills goes on to Seton's personal life as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. I forgot to pick my daughter up from dance yesterday as well. Did you really? I did. Well, we're blaming it on this podcast and how much time it's taking up, but we do appreciate it. And I'm as disorganized. I don't know if it's disorganized as much as we've got. This is not our full time job. So there's a lot of. I'm going to own my disorganization. Okay, I'll own mine too then. Um, today, we're going to dive into a bunch of things. There are four things we want to dive into. Can you run those through uh, with us, Seton? Yes. First, we want to go over a state article that came out yesterday in the state paper talked to Bland, who we actually talked to in our last episode, and he has tracked down the missing money. So that's huge. Okay. We are also going to go over what Eddie Smith says about his version of events that happened the day that Alec Murdoch was shot. Okay. We're going to talk about a recent filing from Connor Cook's attorneys and also briefly touch on the estate of Maggie and Paul. There you go. Good, good. Now, before we roll into all that stuff, we want to thank you for listening. We want to make sure you know that we are very grateful. Never expected to be like this. Well over a million downloads. Overwhelmed by the great praise that we get. And we take your criticism seriously. We're always trying to do better. And I think we've gotten a lot better since the beginning when we assumed no one was listening. <laughs> um, and so we're focused on that getting organized thing as well. Uh we're hurried to get these episodes up as quickly as we can, so we don't script things. We're going to try to do a better job of making an outline. It's not an excuse. It's just we're running a lot of different directions, and we just hope that it works for what you need. And also, uh, Seton, we've talked to people from Colleton County in that area. Yes, we have had many people reach out, and we'd like everyone to know if you want to reach out to us, anything will remain confidential. I think if you listen to us. You know that we're pretty fair. We don't just try to present one side. So again, we love to hear from everybody. And uh, Seton went to high school in the area. My family lives in Charleston, and we're going to make sure that that area, those people are treated with the respect they deserve, not depicted in some malicious way as like bumpkins and lawbreakers. Uh, and we're working with a uh, documentary team the guy who was in charge went to the College of Charleston. He feels that connection to low country. He also uh, was drawn to the case because he has a teenage son who is gay. And so the idea of getting justice for Stephen Smith is huge to him. So contact us and we'll make sure to do our best to make sure you're taken care of. Seton through Facebook at uh, Seton Tucker or 
We now have our own Facebook page. Yes, we do. Uh, Murdoch Podcast. You can go there. I also started a new Gmail because I'm getting tons and I'm trying to get back to you as quickly as I can. But Matt Harris Podcast at gmail.com. And if anybody's friends or family with Maggie Murdoch, we'd love you to reach out because I think we both feel that she's kind of got lost in the shuffle a little bit, right? I mean, we haven't heard much about her life. Everyone is wanting to know. I mean, we just know very little from what we've seen from Facebook posts that she was obviously loved her family more than anything, but that's really all we know about her. And if you want her story told, uh, please reach out. We'll get to the state article about the money that was supposed to end up in the Satterfield Trust, where it went, what's the deal. That is next. All right, we're back and ready to talk about the money. Follow the money. And Seton, break it down. We talked to, before you get to it, obviously, we talked to Eric Bland, the attorney of Gloria Satterfield's two boys, on the previous episode. So I advise you to go back and listen to that. He's great. He's going to be back on with us, as he said, when he gets a chance. So what happened? Okay, so yesterday, the state paper, John Monk, had some breaking news. They had interviewed Bland, and he has located the missing $4.3 million, which the heirs of Gloria Satterfield were to get 2.76 of that. He has given that information to SLED, who is investigating how she died and also what happened to the insurance money. Um, the the What's interesting about this is the information was given to him by Chad Westendorf, who is attorney, who is the banker who administered the estate of the Satterfield kids. So he's clearly working with him. Because he had to know a lot of what was going on because he had this big giant check. And how many big giant checks do you have in this this bank in this tiny town. Right. So he was named, like we said, he's named in the lawsuit as well as Corey Fleming and Alec Murdoch. The order was signed by a judge, Carmen Mullen, um, listed as presiding judge, which is different from the settlement paperwork that we saw, which was presided over by Judge Perry Buckner. Now, they're saying the signature is scrawled and you can't really recognize her signature. That's something to look into. Definitely interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, And also, there is no public record of this. It wasn't filed. There's no case number. So Bland calls this in the article very unorthodox, which definitely seems like that to me. And he he really uh, let us know the inside skinny on that in the previous uh, recording or the previous episode we had. He was really laying it all out there, and it seems like he's been spot on. Yes. Also, Fitz reported this morning that Alec's name was not on the paperwork that was filed. Or not filed. Not filed. Yeah, it was not filed. filed. Right. That's a weird thing. It's no, no case number. And yet it has a judge's signature, allegedly. But it's very scribbled. You can't really tell what it is. Right. And so, also, um, in the Fitz News article this morning, they said that the money went to Bank of America and that it was cashed out by Alec Murdoch. Weird. All right. We want to bring in our legal analyst. You want to bring him in now? Our legal yeah. analyst list and a former DA, former prosecutor, and he's been on the show before to uh, great reviews. He is John Snyder. Hi, John. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. We're excited to be back. Yeah, we're excited. We've gotten such great feedback by the legal analysis you've given us. Our listeners have really enjoyed it. Yes. Hey, John, I, w- I want to blast right out of the gate. Your initial reaction upon reading the news, hearing the news uh, about this missing money in the Satterfield case. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> the greatest thing I've ever seen. Wow. This, this is only the tip of the iceberg, as they say. The, the fact that there is suddenly a mystery order involving $4 million of settlement proceeds from a insurance company where the proponent of the scheme is the defendant is un- unimaginable till now. So one question I had is, how, how is it possible that there could be no public record of this? It, it is not possible in any other lawsuit in the United States <laughs> 
there it has to be filed in a courthouse to, to kick off an action. And the fact that there isn't one and then there is an order for an unfiled lawsuit is unbelievable and against all 50 states legal procedures. So, and Alex's name was not on this order as well. So I, I thought that that was kind of unusual. That the only little hiccup with that is the fact that he might not have been a party to the ultimate settlement agreement between the insurance company and oh. the okay. estate. Oh, well, that does make sense. And also I wanted to ask about um, the settlement was for $4.3 million, but the heirs were only to receive two point seven six. Is that normal or is... That, that's very normal in a, in a case, in a wrongful death lawsuit. The, the standard fee would be 33 and a third percent for the lawyer. He, he or she is taking that on a contingency fee basis. So if, if they're not successful in their lawsuit, a wrongful death suit, they'll get nothing. But if they are successful, they, they get a third. And then you would also take expenses off of that uh, number as well. When I see this, not being a legal expert, but after talking around to many attorneys, you can say if you agree with it or not. But this seems like it's almost a, a Jenga of, of political corruption, and we are down to just one or two more of those little things being pulled out, and there's going to be a big, huge crumbling of many names and many people. I, I think this is a seismic uh, discovery in the case that will have earthquake-like effects not only in the legal community down there, but also in the banking community and in the general community. You've got a, a public official, the, the county clerk, who's, you know, maybe a part of this. You have multiple public officials, different judges involved, all who are, you know, for years have been pillars of their community. And they are now signing off on orders that never get filed with court. And so in North Carolina, for an order to be valid, it has to be filed and signed by the judge. And so the fact that this is like a, a ghost case is just, you know, just a apparent fraud. So one person could not have done this alone. No way one person could have done this alone. So in, in the most recent reports, you have attorneys that, that Murdaugh has encouraged the decedent, the decedent's heirs to hire. Then they've been encouraged to hire a banker to manage the money. And he, he also is making money along the way through all this. And you have the, you have the, the, the guy that did something wrong picking all the people that are going to decide how things should turn out. And we're taking a little break to talk about something we have fallen in love with, which is Green Chef. Seton, you just told me you're ready to go order some more, and so am I. Yes, I love it. There's so many, definitely, choices, and everything is pre-portioned, easy to follow. It makes cooking really simple, especially for a weeknight. Yeah, we're so busy, everybody, running around doing their things with kids and whatnot. So you just get the Green Chef out. It's one little bag. You're good to go. It's America's number one meal kit for eating well, meaning the best meal kit, whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, or just want to eat more balanced meals, this is the way to go. And the the family loves them? They love them, and I don't have to go to the grocery store. That's right. That is a big thing. They come right, and you don't have to worry about missing an ingredient. Go to greenchef.com slash Murdoch10 and use code Murdoch10, M-U-R-D-A-U-G-H-10, to get 10 free meals, including free shipping. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. I'm going to pause for a moment and talk about Warby Parker. I've used Warby Parker for glasses for a couple of years now, so I'm so happy they're signing on as a sponsor for the podcast. And Seton, I know you love the try. Yes, this is the first time I tried Warby Parker, and I ordered my five pairs for free, and you have five days to try them on. There's no obligation to buy, and they ship for free, and they include a prepaid return label. and I love the selection. I found out I have a wide face. Um, <laughs> and I the Daisy Wides were the ones that worked nice. best for me. And my husband complimented me on them, which is not 
like him to notice my <laughs> granny readers. And the glasses start at 95 bucks, including prescription lenses. Don't let your FSA or HSA dollars go to waste. Put them to good use on Warby Parker prescription glasses, prescription sunglasses, contact lenses, and eye exams. Try five pairs of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com slash Murdoch. That's warbyparker.com slash M-U-R-D-A-U-G-H. Yes. Um, do you think, I'm not getting this is speculation, are there a lot of people scrambling to do a little horse trading right now? I, I think anybody that is involved in any of these transactions, including clerks, lawyers, and judges, should be calling their own attorneys and running up to Columbia to the FBI desk in South Carolina. Speaking of FBI. Yeah, so so we've gotten a lot of questions from our listeners about why the FBI is not involved or if we think the FBI will get involved. So when the federal law enforcement gets involved in a case, they, they gather all of their evidence before they announce they've done anything. And so just because we haven't heard doesn't mean nothing's happening. So that's that's step one. Step or, or thing one. Thing two is they only um, like to get involved in things that are cut and dry. So a factual case over, you know, who was driving the boat at the time of an accident, not, you know, n- not their standard case. Um, insurance fraud, public corruption. And banking fraud, that is their their thing. And again, with, where there's smoke, there's fire. And so how many other estate cases have Murdoch gotten these people involved to create some, you know, quote unquote, structured settlement? And the, and the structure is they all make money while the, the plaintiffs get nothing. Hmm. That, that's going to be fascinating to see how that plays out over the next couple of years, even. John Snyder is a former district attorney, former prosecutor, legal analyst for our program, too. Uh, John, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate sure you back. Bye. We'll take a quick break, and we come back. We talk about Eddie, the man who was allegedly in the attempted shooting or attempted murder of... Alec Murdoch. Suicide plot. Suicide plot and fraud for insurance purposes and all that. Talk about our Connor Cook lawsuit and what happened to the Maggie and Paul estate. It's next. All right, let's go to Alec Murdoch and the attempted suicide for hire and the insurance fraud. His cohort in crime, alleged cohort in crime, Eddie, what's he have to say? Well, so New York Post got an article or got an interview with him, and I, I kind of think they might have just pulled up to his house and just timed it right. Just timed it right, um, which kudos to them. Yes, because we I actually tried to call him, yeah. all the numbers listed, but none of them worked. Um, so what he says to the New York Post during this interview is, "I know what they're saying about me, and it ain't true." He says. It's the craziest situation I've be- ever been involved with. I was set up to be the fall guy. And those damn pictures of me in the newspaper. I was looking at them this morning. They didn't even let me take a shower. And Eddie, and Eddie Smith is the Well, and they were bad. I'd be mad if I, if I, yeah, if I had those pictures, yes. too. It did make him look a little bit crazy. And he definitely looks a lot better in the New York he Post. He does. He does look a lot better in that picture. And he also... Well, this is interesting because we said when we read that, remember, no one else, as far as I know, probably somewhere, but we... We said when we read that, his statement did not say he shot the gun. We said that the first day we read it. We yeah. said it says he got rid of the gun. And no one seemed to really latch on to that. Not that we're brilliant or anything, but it bothered me. If he's going to go as far as to say he got rid of the gun, why not say the next level? So he says he did get rid of the gun. Right. And then so and he, him. he says he didn't collude with him in any way. And this is what he kind of explains happened. He said he got a call from... Alec that day, and he thought he was coming to help him fix something. Um, he wasn't sure about it, what that was, but he meets him on, I know we've had old Sakahachi, I'm, I may be saying this wrong. But Hatchy. Hatchy. Right? Hatchy. It's like a hatchet. Okay. They told us. Um, and when he gets there, Alex was in the car. He got out and he was waving the gun like he was going to shoot himself. So then he quotes from the article, I run over and we wrestled for a minute together trying to get the gun away from him. 
Um, he then takes the gun and he disposes of it. And he says that was just plain stupid. stupid. And he, he says he doesn't really know what injuries Alec sustained because he fled the scene. But I kind of, it's weird. I actually in some way kind of believe his version of events. I mean, I think what happened is what you had pointed out before about the turning around in the church, church parking, parking lot. lot is what probably did not corroborate Alex's version of events. He didn't expect that. But, you know, camera. if you if you go and you're involved, your friends having this gun, maybe he was fearful and he's, you know, mm-hmm. his friends brandishing this gun, waving it around and you don't want your this person to kill themselves, but Somebody was saying, we don't want speculation in the... I'm, we're going to give you some speculation. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Because I also see the this guy's thinking, Let, let's play this out and say his fingerprints are on it. And if you're that dude, are you going to say, who's going to believe me? Is it going to believe me or are they going to believe Alec? I'm right, who's a gun, prominent attor- attorney in town. Make this go away. Uh, but also, Eddie in the article says that Alec better stop messing with him. Right. He gave him a little bit of warning. <laughs> don't mess with me anymore. Right, and I mean... We don't know. I guess the court will determine after the you know police and their investigation exactly what occurred. You know, maybe yeah. Alex's version is correct, but right now, and there was drugs in Eddie's home, so he has a, he has to go to court for those too. Oh yeah, that's it. So he has to do that. Uh, now the other thing that's been shaken out is Connor Cook's attorneys have filed uh, officially filed a lawsuit. Now some of you may be confused. It is a little bit confusing, even when I saw the headline, it's a bit confused, because it may have seemed like they had already filed a lawsuit, but they had filed this pre-lawsuit thing where they began to investigate, and now it's an official lawsuit. Right. So, and in the lawsuit, he names Alec, he names Buster, but I found this interesting, he also named Parkers. So, naming Parkers, I mean, maybe he's naming them because they're the, they're the, Big, they're the deep pockets. They're the, the they're the package store where they bought alcohol that night, right. and they are not just a small time thing. They're big in the South, right? And he alleges that Alec and others orchestrated a campaign to blame him as the driver, um, and also a quote whisper campaign to misdirect law enforcement. Um, and also, Alec was negligent in recommending that he hired Corey Fleming. So this is yet another mention of Corey Fleming. So, and the w- reason why, we, we're, if you haven't been following along, Corey Fleming's name comes up in the Satterfield case, the housekeeper who fell and died, because Alec Murdoch had sent Corey Fleming to the Satterfield boys and said, this guy will represent you. Right. He also sent Connor Cook. We want to make sure that we know, tell people that that uh, Corey Fleming and Alec Murdoch are tight. Right. So in the Island Packet article, they say that they were former roommates. He was one of Alec's best friend, and he was also the godfather to Alec's son, Paul. Also in the lawsuit, uh, it alleges that the problem with Paul Murdoch was that he operated family vehicles, including boats while drunk, and was allowed unrestricted use, is the quote, of his mother's credit card to purchase alcohol. They talk about Paul buying 50 bucks worth of alcohol at Parker's, uh, using his older brother's driver's license and the family credit card. So they're suing Alec for negligent entrustment, negligence and intentional infliction of emotional distress, and Buster's getting sued for negligent entrustment and negligent. The suit claiming Buster was negligent in providing his younger brother his driver's license, and there's a whole bunch more to that. Let's hit this, uh, the headline of the Island Packet. Alex Murdoch waived right to handle son's estate days before bot shooting. Eight days before Alec did the 911 thing where he was shot in the head, he said he, uh, probate records show he renounced his rights to personally represent the estate of Paul, his younger son, who was found murdered in June. So on, on August 27th, After his son's estate went to probate, Murdoch signed away his rights to administer the estate and asked his brother to take it over. Not that unusual, they say, for a grieving parent to let their brother, in this case, uncle, who happens to be attorney as well, take over. But the circumstances are 
Well, I mean, he is saying he was struggling with opioid addiction, so right. that could be another reason he decided he wasn't the best person for right. handling that. Financial troubles or opioid addiction, either way. So he, he did turn over the rights uh, to Randy, who's also another Randolph, Randolph the Fourth. So they also took a complete inventory of Paul Murdoch's assets, but that's not been filed. And we have not yet seen any probate filing for Maggie Murdoch. And that's interesting. You think that would have come down at some point. The only demand for notice is for Somerville-based interior design company. And that is the only thing open. And her estate is open for creditors' claims. So that's where we stand on hers. Because a lot of people have been asking about why we... I don't think we've still seen a death certificate for Maggie. No. And we don't know about the probate. Okay. There you go. A lot to, to... hash out in that podcast we hope you enjoyed it again if you like it rate it share it and feel free to reach out to us our facebook page seaton murdoch podcast and reach out to us through that or matt harris podcast at gmail.com or seaton tucker on facebook and we will chat again real soon because i'm sure there's gonna be more coming on again thank you we're so grateful for all the listens